rebirth. Well, one has to be reborn from these tragedies. Uh, one cannot stand in a history that cannot be altered. And of course, the past cannot be altered. But uh, I'm often asked, where was I on 9-11? Because everybody knows that was the day when, when, when life changed, when the world changed, just in a moment. It didn't change gradually. And how strange that I was in Berlin. 9-11 was the day that after 12 years, the Jewish Museum was to open. It was to open on 9-11 at 7 o'clock in the evening. And of course, by about 2.30 afternoon Berlin time, we saw those images of destruction of New York, of Washington, and so on, and the museum never opened. And I've often thought about this, that that's history. We think something is over, we think something is the past, but history doesn't come from the past, it comes from the future, from the unexpected, from the unknown. And that's really how I saw Ground Zero in the first place. So what is the project about? Well, I tried to create something that spoke to the site, that spoke to the symbols of what America really is about, to the bedrock of New York, to 1776, the Declaration of Independence, a, 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 a document of, of some importance, to the fact that I wanted to have water uh, to screen the busy uh, uh, noise of the streets of New York, and to really dedicate the site to a public space, not just the buildings, the massive buildings, 10 million square feet of density of, of office buildings, 5 million square feet of infrastructure, and other 5 million square feet of cultural facilities, complex transformation of transportation. It's a mega project, it's a whole city. But I thought, you know, what would make this project meaningful is really the public space. And here you see in the site plan, Hudson River on the left, you can see the arc where the buildings are standing, you can see the slurry wall in purple, the, the park, the green, the footprints of the buildings, and an attitude to the site which really goes from a sketch to a built reality, the, la the latest rendering uh, of, of what the site is. Now, often people don't know what a master plan is. It's, it's, it's an abstraction. What is, you know, they know what a building is, how it looks and its aesthetics, but what is a master plan? Now, as a musician, a master plan is very close to me. It's like a piece of music. You have a, a piece of music, it's written. It's a bunch of dots and lines, basically, if you know how to read music. It's not a bunch of dots and lines, it's, it's, it's a composition, uh, which is then turned over to others, to an orchestra, you know, a, 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 an overture, a symphony, is a complex book of notes, which is turned over to interpreters. The interpreters have to have a range of freedom to interpret that music, those, those arcs, those tempos, and those sounds. They, they're very precise, just like in a master plan. Every line is very precise, but there has to be a, a glimmer of interpretive freedom for the music not to be just a mechanical music. And at the end, of course, the conductor of the music, the composer of the music, has his back to the orchestra, he's not visible. He's not the first violin, the first cello, the tuba, or whatever is visible on the stage. It's interesting, just like a master plan, a master plan's uh, uh, back is really to the audience. It's a very complex project because if you think of the sketch on the left and the reality on the right, it comes from a drawing. And if you think of the stakeholders, this is, there is not one client here, there's a multitude of clients. First of all, the families of the victims, who, who are in the thousands, mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, cousins, it's in the thousands of people, believe me. There are 3,000 who perished, but there are thousands of those families, not to mention those in the fire department, police forces, those who perished as well. Then there is the Port Authority of New York, a gigantic organization of about 7,000 engineers and architects, 7,000, who owns the site and leases the site to private developers and their own architects. That organization, Port Authority, is controlled by two of the most powerful governors, the governor of New York and governor of New Jersey. Very, very, very political. And the streets of New York, everything you do on the streets, is in the purview of the mayor of New York, another powerful politician. What's underground belongs to the path train authorities, the trains running between New York and New Jersey, and of course subway authorities, the MTA. That's just a small picture 
of the client. So the key to a master plan, as I see it, is democracy. It's how to forge a consensus between parties that have very, very different views of what is good, what is profitable, and what should be built. And that's really the art of the master plan, like the art of any composition of a symphonic work which has to be performed under a precise conductor. The slurry wall, that's what I saw first of the site. And, and I have to tell you this anecdote. I was with the finalists. There were seven finalists, uh, all great colleagues, fantastic architects. Uh, and we were in one Liberty Plaza overlooking the site on a November, gray November day. And somebody in the Port Authority said, does anybody want to go to the site? And every architect said, no, it's much easier to see the site. Like from an airplane, you can see the site perfectly from the top of a skyscraper. But something moved Nina and I to say we want to go down, and we did with those galoshes, those cheap umbrellas, descend some 75, almost 80 feet down to the bedrock. And that's why I realized, that's when my life changed. I, I didn't understand the site until you touch that bedrock where the catastrophe happened. And I happened to touch that wall. And the engineer told me that's the slurry wall. And now in all the years I studied architecture, I didn't exactly know what a slurry wall was. But what it is is a dam, basically, a gigantic dam. On the left side is the really Hudson River and the, the, the pressures of the ocean. Uh, and, and he casually said, you know, Mr. Liebeskin, if this wall had collapsed, then all the subways would have been flooded. The, the entire, it would, would have been truly the apocalypse. So this wall, God, played a great part in my imagination. This is something different than what I thought. So, and I, by the way, called, um, Nina had the telephone, I didn't, I called our office in Berlin. People were still working, even late, late at night. And I said, forget everything we've been doing. It's nothing to do with that. It's about something else altogether. And I'm so glad that I was able to really not only achieve the exposure of the slurry wall, but also make the bedrock itself available. And you know how hard it is that, you know, the bedrock, that whole space between the ground and, and the, where the museum now is, is, you know, huge space. Everybody wants it. Uh, parking space, security space, infrastructure space. It's a very expensive space. But I thought this should belong to people of New York, to people to experience it. And indeed it is part of the museum now. And I was very moved when Pope Francis came to New York. And there was speculation, where would he give his ecumenical address with all the religions around him? Will it be in the Central Park, in St. Patrick's Cathedral, in Times Square? But this pope, very, very smart, he chose the slurry wall because that is what connects people, the solidarity of religion, solidarity of spirituality, solidarity of human beings is around that space of foundations. And by the way, it's very difficult to keep a space of foundation open because foundations are built in order to put something on top of them. Now, we see foundations in ruins, in Rome, in Jerusalem, in Athens, but a living foundation is very difficult to keep open because it wasn't meant to be open. It was meant to, something was meant to stand on top of it. So the exposure of the foundation was a major feat, and I'm glad I had great engineers at the Port Authority who agreed with me on its importance and made it happen. And you can see here in the museum, on the left of the slurry wall, and you can see that the footprints, the waterfalls, come all the way down to that bedrock. And I wanted to keep that space free for the public. This is the most important part, to understand the fullness of the catastrophe, also the fullness of what New York is built from the ground. So here are the, the memorial, very Interesting, more than 25 million people a year already are visiting it. It's not a finished project. It's a project that in the center of New York has this magnetic power with its uh, buildings on the periphery and really the park space, openness towards Hudson River. And I introduced a secondary public space which was not asked for because there's not enough space in New York for public from, from Broadway. I call it the Wedge of Light, which is a space really created by the geometry of sunlight at 8.46 a.m. in the morning when the first tower was struck and 10.28 when the second tower collapsed. And it's a space, uh, you can see it here in an aerial view. It's not fully realized. You can see the center of it, uh, there are two, two lines. Uh, the one on the right 
you can see the foundation built for tower number two, which is not yet there. There are four towers. This one is not yet there. Still a, a taller tower than the Empire State Building to be there. And the center of the Path Terminal, which is on the... And by the way, that Oculus opens on 9-11 completely to the air. And you can sense, even in a day when it is not sunny as it was on that fateful day, you can sense New York, the sense of New York, the sense of memory, which is purely in light and in light of New York. And there it is, the, the buildings as you see them, tower number one, Freedom Tower, tower number three, tower number four, uh, the path ascent, uh, terminal built, performing art center under construction, the museum finished. So I would say 85% of the project I is there. And I uh, really, uh, this is, I end here uh, for that project because that was the first image I had of the project, which was with, with the Statue of Liberty, seeing Manhattan as I saw it as an immigrant from a boat. Uh, and I may, may have, might have been one of the last immigrants to see it, you know, because it became cheaper to fly later on uh, to Kennedy. But I saw it from a boat, and I, s I didn't even know what was written uh, by Emma Lazarus, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled messes, uh, yearning to breathe free. Words that mean something, not only to me, to Americans, despite the rhetoric that you hear from America, it's a country of immigrants. It is a country of liberty. It is a country of democracy. And it, it will be, despite those forces that try to negate what America really is. 